All right, good morning, guys. Welcome to the team. We'll get started. So if you're in the lobby, grab your coffee, come on in the room. It is great to see all your bright, shining, shining faces again this morning. Have to say, missed you so much last week because we had the snowstorm and had to make the decision, very hard decision to, to uh, pull the plugs only like the second or third time in all these years, but probably a wise decision, but set us back a week. So we got a, several announcements as we get started today. First, this is week 20 of this season, but we're going to do lesson 19 today. And next week, since um, we had already planned uh, to do lesson 21 next week, because Pastor Jeff's going to be teaching next week, because I'm going to Florida to watch my son play baseball. But um, so not, lesson 21 will be next week, and I'm going to consider whether or not I can figure out a way to videotape or film session me doing section 20 and posting it somewhere, because it's a good one. Um, but anyway, so 19 today, then 21 next Friday, even though today is week 20. You follow that? Okay. A couple of announcements. On your table, there's a little half-sheet flyer for a new um, ministry or service uh, Chapel Street Church is providing through our Shepherd's Heart Ministry. Has, has to do with job and career coaching. So if you are between jobs or know someone who might be able to benefit from this, uh, there are some guys who made themselves available to do some coaching and helping out with that process. So uh, don't feel free to pick this up, take it with you, or uh, deliver it to someone you know might be looking for uh, work in that way or need that kind of coaching. Uh, we also have another women's conference, huge women's conference coming up on March the 10th. We're doing some recruiting for that. I don't have all the details right now, but it's a Saturday event. They're looking for 16 men to help with service around lunchtime and clean it up. You get to wear black pants, white shirt, bow tie. Everybody loves a sharp-dressed man. Uh, but so I'll email you all the information if you're able to help on that day. It's a great way to serve our women's ministries, and it's really kind of fun, too. So I'll send you that. And you're... Uh, Vince, you're looking for parking guys too. So we'll put all that in one email this coming week so you can know where to volunteer and help out just on that Saturday. So appreciate that very much. One more thing before we start. I want to give a shout out and look right at the camera, wherever it is, to a friend of mine who's in Aurora named Jim Spagnola and his wife, Abby. Jim um, used to come to our church at the South Street campus several years, a number of years ago. Uh, was baptized there, but he has COPD now. Can't get out of his house hardly ever. I uh, was able to visit him last week, uh, this past week, in his home, and he watches team every week. He watches our services every week, so I told him I'd give him a shout-out. Jim, we know you're out there. We're glad you're watching, and we're going to pray for you at the end of today's session, and you'll, you'll know that. So thanks for watching, Jim. And then, uh, so let's get started with our story today. Uh, this is a new one sent to me by a team guy. Husband went to the sheriff's department to report that his wife was missing. Sergeant says, what's the problem, sir? Husband says, my wife is missing. She went shopping yesterday and hasn't come home yet. Sergeant says, okay, sir, what's her height? He says, well, I think a little over five feet. Sergeant says, wait. Husband says, I don't know exactly, not slim, but not really fat either. Sergeant says, eye color. Husband says, uh, blue, I think, no brown. Wait, 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 hazel. Hair color. Husband says, changes a couple times a year. I think maybe dark brown right now. Sergeant says, what was she wearing last time you saw her? Husband says, uh, could have been a skirt, maybe shorts, don't remember exactly. What kind of vehicle was she driving? Husband says she was in my truck. Sergeant says, what kind of truck? Husband says, brand new 2018 Ford F-150 4x4 with EcoBoost 5.0 liter V6 engine. Special order with manual transmission. Custom massing white cover for the bed. Custom leather seats and bubble floor mats. Trailer package with gold hitch. DVD with navigation. 21 channel CB radio. Six cup holders. Four power outlets. Special alloy wheels and off-road Michelin tires. Wife put a small scratch on the driver's side door. At this point, the husband started choking up. Sergeant said, don't worry, buddy, we'll find your truck. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> we're in session 19. Uh, the question we're dealing with today is, who is my neighbor? And so we're call it, calling it the question of compassion. I'm going to watch a clip from um, Gran Torino, which was... Uh, we used a several clips last year or two years ago, I think. Story of a bitter Korean War veteran played by Clint Eastwood. His name is Walt Kowalski. And Walt uh, is at the stage of his life where he kind of hates everybody. Especially he hates the ethnic transformation that's happened in his neighborhood. Uh, people from Southeast Asia called the Hmong people have moved in and sort of taken over the neighborhood. Uh, and he hates it. And he hates everybody except he's 
and, and, and one Hmong kid tries to steal his Gran Torino, which is the story around which the movie is built. But eventually he begins to befriend this kid who tried to steal his car. And the scene you're going to watch here is Walt trying to help this Hmong kid get a job. So let's watch. All set to go through with this, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah, yeah, me. Just say yes, sir, and I'll do my best. Yes, I'll do my best. Because when I vouch for somebody, that means I've given them my word. I don't want you making me look bad. No, I'm good. Totally into this. Don't lay down either. Just uh, look them straight in the eye, and a man can tell a lot by your handshake. Here, put those in your back pocket. Cool. Just don't blow this. Hey, Kennedy. You drunken Irish goon. How are you? I'm well, who's gonna listen? Uh, not me, that's for sure. Oh, uh, help yourself there, Walt. You yeah. dumb Polak. Okay, uh, this is the kid I was telling you about. Uh, Tao, this is Tim Kennedy. He's super on this job. So, uh, what do we got here, Walt? Well, he, uh, he knows construction, and, uh, and he's a smart kid. He'll do anything you need him for. You sure? Yeah. You, uh, you speak English? Yes, sir. Were you born here? You bet. I see that uh, Walt drove you here. You got a vehicle? Not at the moment. Taking the bus for now. A bus? So you don't have a car? My head gets get cracked. To the shop, wants to bend me over for 2100 No, Oh, please. I just replaced the tranny in my Tahoe. This... Just under 3200 These? It ain't right. <laughs> you got that right. Okay, um... Come on in on Monday, and uh, we'll find something for you to do. Thanks, Mr. Kennedy. It's Tim. And uh, what's your name again? Uh, Tom. T okay. You, uh, you owe me one, Walt. Yeah. Well, I'll buy you a fruitcake for Christmas. Oh, the fruitcake? How about you just uh, hand over them keys to that Gran Torino? Everybody want my car. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah, you don't know the half of it. All right, come on, Zipperhead. Uh, we'll let the mix stay here and play with himself. What are we doing? What do you want to do? Carry your tools in a rice bag? There we go. You can use one of these. And you'll need one of these here. I can't afford any of this. I'll cover it. You can pay me back on your first paycheck. Cool. Here. You'll need something like that. And this is what I'm looking for here, a tool belt. There you go. Not to, but won't I be needing some tools? Tools I've got, but I'm not gonna lend you my tool belt. You can pick up tools as you go. I, I really appreciate all this. Forget it. No, I, I really do. Thank you. Uh, quite possibly the most edited clip in team history. <laughs> And if you've seen that, that film, it's, an, it's a um, strikingly, uh, it's a striking film. It, it, everything about it is wrong in almost every single way, but it tells a, a, a beautiful story. Um, and it's a story, the surprising part of the story is the relationship that develops between two people that should not have a relationship. And the surprising part, the shocking part of it is how Clint's character, Walt, begins to love uh, that kid who tried to steal his car. So it's a redemptive story in many ways. The story I'm gonna read today is one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. And I'm gonna read the thing all the way through and then we're gonna uh, break it down and talk about it. Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Okay, this is Jesus, one of Jesus' most recognizable stories. Most everyone in our culture knows what a good Samaritan is. You'll hear the phrase thrown around nearly every week, every year, but many don't know that it was Jesus who originally told the story that referred to as the good Samaritan. They don't know why he told the story. Now, the story is 2,000 years old and is still relevant today. First thing we see, it begins with a religious question. A religious question. I've I've long believed, and this is not rocket science, but there are two great motivations in life. There is have-to motivation and want-to motivation. Have-to and want-to. Have-to. Most of us can remember back in our school days being in a class that we didn't particularly like or have an affinity for or a passion for. For me, it would have been like algebra, or geometry. Uh, Test is coming up, and somewhere uh, in the class, some kid will raise his hand and ask the question that everyone wants to ask, which is, do we have to know that for the test? Right? Do we have to know that for the test? That's have-to motivation. We want to get a passing grade, but we want to do the bare minimum it takes to get that passing grade. Uh, Have-to motivation is obligation and is duty. But there's another kind of motivation, want-to Motivation. Want to motivation is driven by love. For example, uh, me doing my geometry homework in high school was have to. Bare minimum, just get a passing grade. Me working on my jump shot in my backyard with the basketball hoop was want to motivation. Right? Get the difference? This story is about have to and want to motivation when it comes to faith, religion, and God. Verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to Jesus to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you read it? See, Jesus functioned like a rabbi. He liked to answer a question with a question. Our whole year is what questions men should ask. Jesus here asked a question. What's written in the law? How do you read it? The man says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, there's a couple of things going on here that we can miss because we haven't lived our whole lives embedded in Jewish tradition, religion, and culture. The man asking the question is an expert in the law. The Bible says. This means he was extremely religious. That means he was a student of what the Jews referred to as the law of God. Now, what was the law of God? First of all, the center of it was the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses to give to his people Israel back in Exodus 20. Thou shalt not, and thou shalt. Ten laws. Then that was expanded into what the Jews called the Torah, which is the first five books of our Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and included all kinds of laws in there beyond the Ten Commandments, civil laws and religious laws, sacrifices and cleansing rituals. And those were eventually expanded by the Jewish uh, leadership and by the priesthood uh, to be a commentary that was called the Talmud. And in the Talmud, there are over 600 laws that were to guide Jewish religious and civil life. So, Why does this expert come to Jesus with this question? He was an expert in the law. Why does he need to ask Jesus a question? What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. Well, two reasons. He wants to know two things. First of all, he wants to know what Jesus thinks about the law. Remember, it says he came to test him. We'll cover that in a minute. And secondly, he wants to know whether he's done enough to pass the test. That's have-to motivation. Have I done enough 
to pass the test that God's putting me through. So when Jesus says, do this and live, he's kind of blowing the guy's question out of the water. Because even this guy knows, because he's an expert in the law, because he knows there's not only the Ten Commandments, but 611 religious laws he must keep perfectly. Even this guy knows no one keeps the law of God perfectly. No one loves God with all their heart. No one loves their neighbor completely as themselves. Okay, so Jesus says, do this, all of it, and you will live. The guy's really trying to lay a trap for Jesus because Jesus has been teaching something a little different than he's used to hearing. Jesus has been teaching that the law, even though it's good and true, is not that which grants eternal life and salvation. Jesus was teaching in his early ministry that God is far more interested in our hearts than in our religious behavior. Jesus was teaching that it's very possible to be religious, even very religious, but to be far from God in our hearts. So this is a very religious question the guy's answering, and Jesus is responding in a way that blows his question out of the water. Secondly, we see it's also a dishonest question. It's a dishonest question, verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, here's why that's a dishonest question. This man's assumption, because of his background in the law and in Jewish tradition and Jewish culture, his assumption is that God's requirement is that he love his friends. That God's requirement is that he love those who are like him, that he loves good Jewish people. Because everybody who wasn't Jewish was not chosen of God and was an outsider and was unclean. So his assumption is, love my neighbor means love those just like me. And then I'm free to hate those and look down on those who are not like me. And by the way, that's still what's going on in the world today, 2,000 years later. So when he asks, who is my neighbor, he's really making a statement, sort of a hidden statement to Jesus. He's saying, surely you don't literally mean my neighbor, because that could be anybody. Surely you mean by neighbor, you mean other good Jews, the people who are just like me. So Jesus chooses to tell a story right here. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he's attacked by robbers. Okay, first thing, we can miss this here too because we aren't familiar with the area. We don't know the culture. We don't know the roads. Uh, Anyone listening to this story in the first century in that community would have immediately thought, well, that guy who's going on the road to Jericho is an idiot because it was known to be, I've I've actually walked that road, part of the road when we visited Israel a couple years ago. It's a steep road. It's it's mountainous. It's uh, treacherous. And it was very famous for being a road where where bandits hid out on, so it was a dangerous road. You didn't walk that road by yourself, ever. You did it in a whole group with plenty of protection, okay? It would be like in our culture saying a guy in a $1,000 suit wearing a Rolex watch, carrying gold plate, a briefcase, went for a walk at night on the south side of Chicago. We'd be going, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, he's asking for trouble, right? That's what everybody would have thought, asking for trouble, okay? Jesus continues. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead, person listening to the story would say, well, he got what was coming to him. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man pass by on the other side. Okay, now a priest in that culture, one of the most respected, the most respected, religious and righteous kind of person. So we would expect him to stop. However, in that culture, the priest also had to worry about religious law. And the religious law of the time, one of them was prohibitive of touching blood and especially touching a dead body. So if that guy was dead over there and the priest went over to help him and made him ceremonially unclean, he would have to go through like two weeks of cleansing rituals even to be able to perform his job as a priest. So because of the law, he can't stop and help that guy. Right? That's what's going on in the culture. Verse 32, so a Levite, also a religious guy, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Same thing, religious man, but he had to worry about the law, the requirements of the law. It was very inconvenient to go do that. 33, but a Samaritan, when he traveled, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now here's where the listener in Jesus' day would go, oh, 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 time out, time out. Wait a second. I think you misspoke, because I think I just heard you say Samaritan, Surely you meant to say something else. 
See, the Samaritans were despised by the Jews who thought of them as traitors, as sort of half-breeds to the faith, thought so, because they had intermarried with Gentiles. He, they saw them as unclean, as dirty. If Jesus was telling the story today, he might say, a Muslim cleric came walking by, or an illegal alien came walking by. Something shocking, something we would never expect in a million years. That's what's going on in his story. Verse 34, he, the Samaritan, went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which is two full uh, day's wages, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, this is really hard for us to register the shock and scandal of this story. It's a brilliant story. It's only a few words long, but it touches so many things. Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Now, on top of that, he points out the failure of religious law. The priest and Levite are so worried about passing the religious test that they can't express basic compassion to a broken and hurting man. Half to motivation just doesn't work when it comes to religion and faith. Jesus is illustrating that God's grace, what God's grace, what God's compassion, what God's love really looks like. And what it looks like is want to motivation. So the third part, part of the story is a simple question. So it starts with a religious question goes to a dishonest question, and then a very simple question. Uh, but before I get there and tell a story, my um, third son, Micah, who's a uh, senior at the University of Minnesota, the one I'm going to go watch play baseball next week, um, recently, after Christmas break, had to drive back to uh, Minneapolis. And it was uh, a week where there had been some snow, and the last couple of days it had been terribly cold, and it actually snowed the day before, and he was going to drive his... Uh, 18-year-old Mercury Mountaineer back to, 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 the, to, to the university. Uh, it's a six-hour trip, 400 miles, and he was going to leave really early in the morning to get there. So I went out with him, and the last thing I say to him, because the snow, the, the roads are, are, it's really cold, and it's, the roads are slick and all that, I say, what? You know, okay, be careful. Make sure you know that the roads are dry uh, because it's a long trip, and you're by yourself, and it's dangerous. So I say just the typical dad thing, you know, be careful driving your truck back up there. He says, got it, jumps in the truck, drives away. Sure enough, an hour later, he calls um, from his cell phone, and he's in the ditch outside Rockford. He said somebody pulled out in front of him, and he hit, touched the brakes, touched the brakes, and skidded off to the road into the snow. He's on the side, can't get back on the road. I find out later from one of his brothers that it wasn't quite that simple, that there was a, there, there was a 360 involved. <laughs> sliding off the road backward. He didn't tip or anything. But so the first thing I ask is, are you safe? I'm good. I'm safe. Um, cars and ditch can't get back in the road. Okay, you got to call AAA. We have AAA membership. Use your card. Call. You got to wait. It's going to take them forever to get there because who knows how many cars are off the road. And I thought, I'm not, I, I didn't really get on him, but I really wasn't happy, you know, because you warned, I warned him, but he was safe. So he's okay. I'll call. So he's frustrated and I'm frustrated. So, um, and then he calls back about 20 minutes later and says, got to hold of AAA. Uh, they're on the way. I said, good, good job. Just keep your car warm. And I found out later he also locked himself out of his car with the, with the motor running, had to crawl in the back. So it's, it's a whole story that he didn't tell me. He told one of his brothers. So, uh, but while he's on the phone this time telling me he's contacted AAA, I hear him go, I can hear him saying, hold on, Dad, hold on, Dad. What? Yeah, no, I'm okay. What? Oh, and he goes, hang on, Dad, I'll call you right back. So I don't know what's happening. Figured maybe somebody stopped to help him. So he calls back 20 minutes after that, and he's back on the road. I said, what happened? He goes, well, while I was talking to you, after I called AAA, a pickup truck rumbles up to the side of the road, and a lady hollers out of the window, and that's who I heard him talking to. It was a lady in her late 20s, early 30s, uh, Wisconsin license place, and she hollers over, do you need help? And he goes, well, I just called AAA. He, she goes, I got a rope here. And this woman jumps out of her truck wearing a Packer jacket. <laughs> wearing a Packer jacket, drags the ropes out of her truck, crawls underneath in the snow, underneath his truck, hooks him up, drags his car back out onto the road, snow all over, jumps back in her truck, Packer jacket and everything, and drives away. Now I'm going, now that's a Wisconsin woman, right? <laughs> 
But she was his good Samaritan that day. And I said, you got a good story to tell now. And he said, yeah, she probably had a beer and a brought for breakfast, you know. <laughs> That's a good Samaritan. That's what we think of as a good Samaritan. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, watch this. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on. Notice, he can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. That's the easiest answer, the Samaritan man, right? No, the one who had mercy. He can't even say the name. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, there are several layers to this story. First, what does it mean to be a neighbor? That's one level. What does it mean to be a neighbor? Does it mean to be a neighbor and offer compassion to those who are like you and believe like you believe? Does it mean to offer compassion to those who are unlike you, who might even hate you in another setting? Does it mean to go to just do the religious minimum? Does it mean to go beyond the religious min minimum? Is it have to or is it want to? Second, what is the purpose of the law? That was how the question started, right? What's the law say? How do we relate to God? Is it about law? The purpose of the law is twofold, the Bible says. First, to show what God requires. What does righteousness look like? And secondly, to show us we can't keep it completely. We just can't. We cannot keep God's law completely. Therefore, the law can't save us. Third, what is the nature of salvation? That's in this story. Salvation is not through the law. It's not have to. It's not keeping the rules. Salvation is through grace. Salvation is a gift. The gift, grace, is what the Samaritan offered to the man lying broken on the side of the road. Grace is not a list of do's and don'ts. Grace is a relationship. Grace is want to. Now, when Jesus tells a story, you've probably heard me say this before, when he tells a story, he wants us to find ourselves in the story. That's why you tell a story. It connects somewhere. And as I see it, there are three options, three ways to find ourselves in this famous story. First, we might be, uh, find ourselves in the character of the priest or the Levite, the guys who passed by on the other side, don't have time, don't want to risk involvement, don't really want to get our hands dirty, don't want to show compassion to someone who might not be like us. Okay, we've, we found ourselves there. I've found myself there on occasion. Or we can see ourselves in the character of the Good Samaritan. We are willing to be a neighbor. We want to be a good neighbor, even to those who are not like us if they need help. No matter what the cost, we're willing to be the woman in the packer jacket helping out the kid on the side of the road. And this is usually where we land when we read this story. And that's a good place to land. That's part of what Jesus was saying. What does it mean to be a good neighbor? What does it mean to be Walt Kowalski reaching out and loving the kid who tried to steal his car. That's what it means to be a good neighbor. And that's a good place to land. But there's still a third option when we dig deeper into the story. And the third option is the man lying broken on the side of the road. Right? That's a third option. Until we see that we are the man left for dead on the side of the road, unable to help ourselves, unable to save ourselves, needing the compassion and grace of another, we don't understand the gospel. Until we understand that Jesus is our good Samaritan, we don't understand the gospel. It's only when we understand that we cannot save ourselves by trying to be good enough by trying to keep all the have-to rules of religion. Only when we understand we are saved by a relationship, by the God who took on flesh at great cost to himself, paid our penalty, paid for our healing, then we understand the gospel. Then we're able to love those who are unlike us. Then we can become good neighbors to others. Here's the questions we should deal with around the table today. Just two, and you can go anywhere you want with these. First, does neighboring come naturally to you or do you have to work at it? Explain. Does neighboring come naturally to you or do you have to work at it? Secondly, can you think of a time when someone was that kind of neighbor to you? Okay, get your coffee, talk about those questions, anywhere else you want to go, and I'll wrap you up for prayer right about 6.50.